Hello everybody, my name is Katrin Netzig and today I want to talk about what are we measuring with MEG, so MEG or EEG, as part of the SPM MEG EEG course. We'll talk a little bit about how we record electrophysiological signatures or signets, we we'll specifically focus on MEG and EEG here. We we'll talk briefly about mobile solutions which are up and coming and are available for both EEG and MEG. Let me talk about what we're actually measuring with these electrophysiological techniques. Um, so what's the neurophysiological basis of EEG or MEG signal? And then we are going into the most popular signatures of EEG or MEG, that is event related potentials, um, oscillatory activity, um, transient burst events, we will touch upon connectivity and aperiodic 1 over f activity, the last two only very briefly just to highlight um, that they're there and to highlight what the difference is to some of the other um, prominent signatures. So how do we record electrophysiological signals? So brain activity can be measured with a variety of neuroimaging methods and those differ in several aspects. So EEG or MEG measure changes in neural activity and they have excellent temporal precision, uh, exactly to the millisecond, but their spatial resolution is with a centimeter accuracy comparably poor. In contrast, fMRI and PET measures, for instance, measure regional cerebral blood flow alterations um, that are associated with neural activity. These provide excellent spatial precision, but very low temporal resolution. And besides temporal and spatial resolution, more recently, the degree of mobility um, or degree of immobility has been taken into consideration when evaluating different recording techniques as well. For instance, EEG and FNS and also the new MEG system, OPMs, um, we will talk about this later, um, have a high degree of mobility and are providing a great opportunity to investigate human brain activity in more naturalistic environments doing more naturalistic tasks. But we will come back to these mobile applications later. As you can see here, like different imaging techniques provide complementary advantages with regard to the spatial resolution and temporal resolution. And since no technique on its own can provide a comprehensive picture, the combination of multiple techniques has gained wide popularity. For instance, one can test the same subject using the same paradigm twice, once for instance using EEG or MEG, and once using fMRI, or even using EEG and then separately MEG. Separate recordings, however, have their drawbacks compared to simultaneous recordings. Um, so simultaneous recordings avoid order effects and moreover ensure identical sensory stimulation, identical subjective experience and identical behavior, which guarantees that exactly the same brain activity is measured with two separate imaging modalities or techniques. So this is just a zoomed in version of just now focusing on the electrophysiological recordings alone. And here we can really see the differences in spatial resolution even between EEG, MEG and ECOG. So they're very comparable in their temporal resolution, but on their spatial resolution they differ a little bit from like centimeter to millimeter. And then as a whole different category we have basically single unit, multi-unit um, activities. And that is basically can be compared um, to kind of like interviews or recording signals um, from a stadium. So if we have a single unit recording on the left in A, that is very similar to basically getting an interview from one person. So in a single unit recording, um, the cell or the, the probe is basically inserted into the cell body and you really get only the recording from this one particular cell that is basically asking a single person in an interview in a fairly quiet environment. And in B, we have kind of like multi-unit recordings. That means the probe is outside a cell body and basically records several cells at once. Um, that is very similar to basically putting a microphone in a very busy press room. You might understand several different things. Um, depending on where the microphone is, you might pick up some speaker um, more than a speaker that is further away that is similar for the neurons. And if everybody says the same thing, it is very easy to pick up the signal. And then for the signals we are working with most of the time, like EEG, ECOG or MEG signals, that is a really hard task because it is basically trying to figure out what's going on inside a stadium with a couple of microphones 
and the outside of the stadium and you can see that you really need a lot of people saying the same thing, singing the same song in order to pick up something usable um, from the speakers that are outside of the stadium. So it's just like an analogy of how we can kind of like go from our single multi and then e e record single multi-unit recording to EG and MEG recordings um, as an analogy of basically having an interview with one person just putting a, a, a microphone into a busy press room or trying to understand what's going on inside the stadium from the outside. And again, here's kind of like a bit of a more zoomed in version to compare EG, MEG and ECOG. So on the left side, we kind of like see the, the, the direct comparison of kind of like where the recording or where the senses are relative to the signal. Um, so with EG on the left, we see the electrode really on top of the scalp and we're trying to record the signals from inside the brain. Um, and basically the, the fluid um, surrounding the brain and also the bones, they basically act as a low pass filter. So it makes the signal smaller and also spreads the signal further in space. Um, then we have like MEG where we have the sensors outside as well um, of the scalp and not directly touching the skull, but a little bit further away. Um, but here we're measuring magnetic field and magnetic field is actually less disturbed by the fluid and by the bones. Um, so we kind of like have less decay than in the EG and the signal quality, although the MEG sensors are a little bit further away. And this is because we're measuring the magnetic field. Um, which is more resistance to bone and fluid conductivity than the electric field. And then for the ECOG on the right, it's like an invasive technique, but there we basically have the recording um, electrode directly on the cortex. So again, we have no disturbance of the um, CSF or, or the skull in the skull, um, but it is an invasive technique and we do record electric signal. And on the right side, we see a couple of um, simultaneous recordings. For instance, on the top, we have um, recordings from LFP data, so like deep electrodes in amygdala hippocampus. And then we also have for like ECOG data in terms of like a strip and a grid. Um, and on top of this, we have scalp EEG uh, over both hemispheres. In this case, it's FZ and O2. And this is um, from a particular patient with drug-resistant epilepsy. And we can clearly see that the amplitude of the signal um, is much larger in the LFP data compared to the EG data and that the higher frequency patterns are much um, easier visible in the ECOG or LFP data than in the EG data. And then on the bottom, again, it's like data from a, a patient with drug-resistant epilepsy and it's uh, simultaneous recorded MEG and um, intracranial EG from the hippocampus. And again, we can really see very nicely how similar the theta oscillations look like recorded by the steep electrode and then the traces from the MEG um, without any like phase delay. The amplitude of magnetic fields created by the brain are extremely small and they do not exceed a few hundred femtotesla, so it's like 10 over minus 15 tesla. Um, and if we compare this to the Earth's magnetic field, this field strength is between 10 over minus 4 and 10 over minus 5 Tesla. So the Earth's magnetic field is much stronger than the magnetic field created by the brain. So to record these very small magnetic fields from the brain, there are basically two issues. One is how do we record magnetic fields that are that small? And secondly, how do we shield out the much stronger um, magnetic field from, from the Earth. And the technology that has helped to record these small magnetic fields is superconducting quantum interference detector, or SQUID, um, which is slightly very, a very high sensitive magnetic field meter. And to maintain this superconductors, one need to provide an extremely cold environment which is achieved by using liquid helium, which is only like three degrees above absolute zero, which is kind of like roughly minus 270 um, degrees Celsius. So that's basically how we can detect these very, very small uh, magnetic fields, which kind of like a, a super detector or a super sensitive magnetic field meter. And the second problem is how do we attend the um, 
Earth's magnetic field is kind of like often, or most of the time, that this is done by um, creating a magnetically shielded room. So most MEGs, especially the squid, the squid MEGs, will be housed inside a magnetically shielded room to shield out the magnetic field effects from, from the Earth's magnetic field. And the actual sensors that are inside an MEG, or in these squid sensors, um, they can be of two types, either magnetometers or gradimeters. And um, there are also two different types of gradimeters, axial or planar gradimeters. And in this example here, we have um, this picture from a Neuromag electromagnetic scanner, which has 102 magnetometers and 204 planar gradiometers. And in general, magnetometers provide um, best signal and are more sensitive to deep brain sources, but they're also more sensitive to competing magnetic noise. And gradiometers are much better in noise reduction. Um, so there's a comparison here, that's a CTF system. And here we have kind of like axial gradiometers, um, which, which are housed in this um, system only. And so it's kind of like important to know which system you're looking at if you are interpreting spatial topographies, because the axial gradiometers, planar gradiometers, and magnetometers give you slightly different um, topographies. And if we compare the MEG and the EEG again, then we can see with MEG it does not detect radial dipoles, but tangential dipoles are seen on the MEG. And this is because the corresponding magnetic field of a radial dipole remains inside like the intracranial space, so it's a space within the skull that accommodates basically the brain. And therefore it cannot detect it by the sensors from outside this space or outside the brain. So in general, MEG does not detect radial dipoles, but tangential dipoles and EEG can kind of like detect um, radial and tangential dipoles. So here we have kind of like a, a brief overview about this kind of like different recording techniques comparing EEG and like squid MEG, where we have differences in signal magnitude, um, where MEG is much more difficult to detect. Um, differences in signal purity, where the EEG will be attenuated by the skull and scalp and the CSF. Uh, temporal resolution is very similar and the spatial localization is um, better with MEG. And then in terms of like experimental flexibility, like EEG moves with the subject, MEG is um, the squid base, MEG at least is stationary. And then for the dipole orientation with EEG, we can see tangential and radial dipoles. And with MEG, we only see tangential dipoles. As I already mentioned earlier, it's not only about spatial resolution and temporal resolution. Another classification of recording modalities is kind of like the degree of mobility and especially for EEG but also in recent years coming for MEG mobile solutions have been um, available so for EEG we have a relatively wide market um, we've seen like a, a search in, in commercial attention in recent years forking on hardware miniaturization and this really leads to a, a, a vast majority of kind of like portable EEG devices. Um, some of them are definitely better than others and it's like some of them are definitely have to be used a little bit with, with care. Um, this review paper here provides quite a nice overview of kind of like the different mobile EEG systems and, and compares them against different parameters. So if we kind of like have a look at one of them, kind of like this um, Smarting Pro here, then we just see some examples of how it could work. So it could work on recording on your mobile phone. Um, so you can just have everything is set mounted. You have the data basically recorded to the phone in your pocket. So you can imagine walking in the supermarket um, during real life activity, studying the brain in real life, doing real life actions rather than stationary in a laboratory on like artificial tasks, for instance. And also for OPMs, as I've mentioned earlier, for the MEGs, there are more um, recent developments into mobile devices, and these are called OPMs, so optically pumped magnetometers. You can see here like a comparison between the squid MEG and the OPM MEG, um, where the OPM MEG is much closer, the sensors are much closer to, to the head, which also leads to a stronger signal strengths in, in the topography, as you can see. 
um, just because the, the distance of sensor to scalp. And then also OPM MEG basically does not require cooling, it's less expensive, more practical, uh, and, and mm -hmm. as I said, helmets enable this like enhanced signal strength. There's much more to come, uh, so a lot of development in, in this area. Just to give you some examples from the OPM applications, for instance, here we see two play, pe people um, playing ping pong. So that's kind of like a more real life movement. And we also at the same time have a social interactions of two people interacting with each other. So we see here on in C, very classic motor related oscillatory activity um, that is localized to the motor cortex. And then we kind of like can calculate, for instance, the autocorrelation between subjects. So that's all work done in, in Nottingham, um, in Matt Brooks. Or what also the OPMs enable, for instance, to put these sensors at different locations, at locations where we perhaps before couldn't measure MEG signals. So in this case, that's work from UCL, um, we place basically sensors on, on the brain areas, the motor cortex, um, but also we had a lot of OPM sensors uh, down along the spine in order to basically measure signals simultaneously from the brain and the spine um, and see how, how the signal um, travels. That's just like a little bit of a detour of kind of like mobile recording um, techniques uh, for both MEG and EEG. So in the next couple of slides, you want to have a look at the neurophysiological basis of the electrophysiological signals we are measuring with MEG and EEG. So technically, there are two main types of electrical activity associated with neurons that are action potentials and postsynaptic potentials, so PSPs. So it's really just in a nutshell. Action potentials are very discrete voltage spikes that travel from the beginning of the axon at the cell body to the axon terminals where neurotransmitters are released. So it's very short in time. Postsynaptic potentials, or PSPs, are voltages that arise when the neurotransmitter binds to receptors on the membrane of the postsynaptic cell. That's why they're called postsynaptic potentials, PSP. So in the vast majority of cases, surface electrodes, like in MEG, EG, ECOG, cannot detect action potentials as the timing and the physical location of these action potentials lead to cancellations before they can be recorded at the scalp. Because they're so brief and the time it takes for them to, to the activity to travel to the electrode, it will basically already be net zero because you always have one side positive, one side negative. Postsynaptic potentials can, under certain conditions, summate, which makes it possible to record even at a greater distance. That's been shown here in B. And computational models as well as empirical evidence have shown that you need roughly a minimum of like 10,000 to 50,000 cells in order to produce a signal that is detectable with MEG. So most of the signal we will be recording with MEG and EEG is uh, caused by postsynaptic potentials. So then the excitation of these postsynaptic neurons basically creates an extracellular voltage near the neural dendrites that is more negative than anywhere else along the neuron. So the postsynaptic neurons are excited in the dendrites. So that means it's positive inside and negative outside. Um, and then this whole situation is referred to as a dipole because then it's most positive inside, which means the other side of the neuron is negative. Um, so that leads, basically leads us with a, with a dipole or like a battery. So a dipole is a region of positive charge separated from a region of negative charge by some distance. So the, the region of positive charge is referred to as source and the region of negative uh, charge is referred to as sink. Um, and electrodes can detect the sum of positive and negative charges in their proximity. So in, in a case where an electrode is equidistant, so same distance away from both the source and the sink of the dipole, the electrode will measure a net neutral, so it will measure zero. And uh, that's shown like in B at the bottom um, on, the, on the tender and gentle dipole. So an electrode can only detect dipoles where the electrode is closer to either the positive or the negative end of the dipole. So again, like on the tangential dipole at the bottom, we can kind of like see that the electrode at the top can measure 
um, the negative charge and the positive charge on either end of the tangential dipole, but in the middle, the positive and negative charge would be net zero. Um, which is different for the radial dipole on top. So therefore, this is a basically coming back to these two major types of dipoles. We can measure with EG radial and tangential dipoles, will be with MEG, we mostly see tangential dipoles. So as we can see in the picture, radial dipoles are oriented perpendicular to the surface, tangential dipoles are in per parallel to the surface. So in a single neuron's dipole, like in this previous schematic, is too small to be measured as far away as the skull is. However, because the electrodes always detect the sum of charges in their proximity, the dipoles for multiple neurons in a region might sum up together. However, to produce such a like, non-zero measurable, non-zero signal, neurons must be arranged in, in a particular fashion. So like, they should be ideally parallel and they should be synchronously active. And this is shown as this figure here on the bottom. So like in, in A, we have negative signals, which will sum up to be measured at the scalp from the top. In B, we have like positive and negative signals, which will cancel out at the scalp. So therefore, this signal in B is not measurable. And in C, we don't have a, a clear dipole activity, joint activity that emerges from this like random arrangement of positive and negative charges. So again, no signal will be uh, measurable at the scalp. And the scenario we have in A in the schematic is most likely occurring in cortical parameter cells, as these are mostly aligned perpendicular to the surface of the cortex. And a final interesting thought about the neurophysiological basis of MEG and EEG signal is that we kind of like with MEG and EEG signal, we cannot determine whether the activity is excitatory inhibitory. <coughs> So for instance, the neuron on the left is receiving either in inhib inhib inhibitory PSP, which produces extra cellular positivity near the soma, the cell body, or it has received an excitatory PSP at the dendrites, which then produces extra cellular negativity around the dendrites. And either of these cases would always lead to a dipole and create automatically the other part. So both of these scenarios um, would be uh, measured as a negative deflection in the MEG or EEG. And on the right, we have the opposite case. So the neuron on the right is either receiving an excitatory PSP near the soma, which then leads to inhibition in the extracellular space, or in inhibition PSP on the dendrites, which then leads to positive charges in the extracellular space. And again, both of these cases would be measured as a positive deflection in the EEG or MEG. So again, we cannot, like, on a, on a single neuron level, we cannot say, okay, this neuron received excitation, excitation or inhibition, because depending on where it is and where we measure the signal, both of this could be true. Next, I want to talk about the common electrophysiology signatures. Um, so one of the most prominent signatures are probably event-related potentials and neural oscillatory activity. So let's start with event-related potentials. So event-related potentials, or ERPs, are brief changes in slow-wave electrophysiological signals in response to a discrete sensory stimulus. So on the left side here, we see the ERP theory in a really small nutshell. So as illustrated, the assumption is that the signal consists of ongoing or background activity and also the response to a time-locked event. So usually averaging is necessary because for some of the ERP components, the ongoing activity is much larger in amplitude than the response. And because the response is assumed to be stable or consistent across trials, which is not always true, so this assumption is technically invalid, um, it is basically preserved in the time domain when we average the different trials of the response. And the ongoing background activity is basically assumed to be net zero if we average different trials um, of ongoing background activity and we have enough of these trials. <coughs> 
So therefore, if we then combine again the ongoing EEG activity, which after a couple of trials should be net zero, and the response, which should be fairly stable, um, we kind of like with enough trials see a, a nice ERP in, in the measured signal in the average across several trials. Um, and this like signal to noise, so the cleanliness of kind of like the ERP will improve with the number of trials that are included in the average. Um, so one can, for instance, estimate something like the SNR or signal to noise ratio. So it's a signal strength, so like a quality measure of the amplitude relative to the ongoing background activity. And obviously for the ERP, also for the signal, often people use the amplitude of the response of interest. And in order to measure the noise, people often use the standard deviation of the pre-stimulus interval. And this is then how we can cal calculate the signal to noise ratio and basically provide um, a measure of um, signal strength or, or quality measure. Um, ERPs uh, consist of a number of like negative or positive waves. So they're typically denoted with a capital N for negative and a capital P for positive waves. And they're produced in a few hundred milliseconds after the stimulus is presented. So sometimes these waves, you really have to watch the y-axis. Sometimes positive waves are um, depicted upwards and sometimes positive waves are depicted downwards. This is kind of like a bit of an historical artifact and only occurs in ERP literature. Um, so really watch your y-axis. And um, positive and negative waves are numbered accordingly to the time at which they're produced or occur. So for instance, a P300 is a positive deflection after 300 milliseconds. So it's often called P300 or in short, a P3. Um, and it's like this 300 milliseconds after the stimulus presentation. And uh, most ERP studies like really focus on like the ERP amplitude and latency and, and probably the topography of the ERP. So this is a neurocognitive model, just to give one example of auditory sentence processing. And I'm showing this model because it really nicely shows the importance of ERPs to advance our understanding of cognition and behavior. I'm really not a linguist, but I really kind of like quite like this example. So just to pick out two components. So for instance, there's evidence for this model is provided by several experiments um, around word violations and these violations of context and when this violation happens in a sentence and happens in, in happens in hierarchy and happens in time. So for instance, in the in the phase one violations, uh, they're called like creating an Elan response, is basically a word category violation. So that is basically if we compare the shirt was ironed, which is correct, compared to the blouse was on ironed, um, which is wrong. So it's basically a word category violation and it produces a very early response, 150 to 200 milliseconds since um, from the offset of the violation, um, and which is called this ELAN. And then if you have a look at the second example for phase two, it's basically a semantic violation um, where we have the shirt was ironed or the thunderstorm was ironed. Um, and here is a semantic violation and this is reflected in an N400, so negative deflection or like 300 to 500 milliseconds um, after the stimulus or the violation happened. Um, so it's much later processed. Um, so that clearly shows the hierarchy of kind of like word category violation happens before semantic violation happens. And interestingly, actually, if both violation happen in one sentence, we only see an Elan and not um, the N400. So again, it's just a really nice example of kind of like how this temporal precision of MEG and EEG can really kind of like advance our neurocognitive model of, in this case, auditory sentence processing. Another prominent electrophysiological activity or signature is oscillatory activity or oscillations. Like neural oscillations are defined as frequency specific patterns of neural activity. So they can occur spontaneously, such as sensory motor rhythm or alpharism, or they can be induced, such as a steady state visual evoke potential. And then modulations of these features, for instance, frequency, amplitude, phase, power, uh, correlate with behavior, such as perception, attention, memory, or motor action, and also um, disease specific differences in amplitude phase frequency have been, been found and they have been suggested, for instance, as biomarker for separate diseases, most notably Parkinson's disease, autism and schizophrenia, for instance. 
Here we see an example of just like a resting state power spectrum. So what we see on the x-axis is it's just frequency in Hertz. And on the y-axis, we see power, or in this case, the beta estimate. And we see this very characteristic shape of kind of like 1 over f, which is like lower uh, frequencies always have higher amplitudes. And then in this case, um, which is data from an ongoing uh, project in a collaboration between Oxford and Cambridge, is the ANTAP project, where they're looking at um, early Alzheimer's mild cognitive impairment, um, we can kind of like see that patients actually, when they have a resting state, or when they have their eyes open, they kind of like see a frequency, frequency shift in their alpha frequency. So alpha frequency is very dominant in the occipital cortex. It's around 10 hertz in this frequency range from 8 to 12 hertz. And we, for instance, in the eyes open condition can clearly see that the control um, participants have kind of like higher alpha frequency than the patients. And then the, in the resting eye state eyes closed condition, we first of all see that if eyes closed increases alpha power. So that's a classic fact. If you have your eyes closed, your alpha power is higher than if you have your eyes open. Um, and we can see that in a control participants have like much stronger amplitude of this alpha frequency than, and then the patients. This is just like one example, but it's a very clear characteristic of to represent electrophysiology, EEG and MEG data with a power spectrum, with um, power, or in this case, beta estimate on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. And then comparing, for instance, different conditions, um, as in this case, uh, or uh, different patients. But in addition to kind of like power and frequency, um, there are also other characteristics in oscillatory activity. Um, one very prominent one is, for instance, the face or um, the shape which can be expressed by the face of um, oscillation. So here in red, we can kind of see the occipital alpha rhythm um, from one example. So this is from um, very neat waveforms from human ECOG recordings. But we can see that this is a very, uh, very oscillatory sinusoidal activity in the red um, picture. Compared to the green picture, which is kind of like the same frequency range, like sensory motor mu is typically 8 to 12 hertz over sensory motor cortex, and occipital alpha is usually 8 to 12 hertz over occipital cortex. Um, but we see the shape looks very different. So the green trace looks much less sinusoidal than the red trace. So here we have narrower troughs and like fatter peaks um, in, in the oscillation. And kind of like these aspects of the oscillation can be described. In order to describe this, one really has to characterize it by phase. So phase basically indicates a particular point along the oscillatory cycle between 0 and 2 pi, um, which correspond to peak, trough, and somewhere in between. So we have like the, the peak, the trough, we have midline crossings, um, for instance. And this is really very, very characteristic, a very classic characteristic of um, one oscillatory cycle. And here we have kind of like a schematic from Natalie where we can really kind of like um, schematically compare a classic sinusoid in red, which would be basically like occipital alpha, um, and the uh, blue one, which would be much more like sensory motor mu. So it's like fatter peaks and very narrow troughs. And you can see on the left how this kind of like um, how, how this activity moves through the same phase cycle but speeds up and slows down in specific aspects and is therefore not sinusoidal. Here we have an example study which shows the phase dependency of excitability. So in this case they're looking at motor evoked potential, so it's motor cortex excitability using TMS. And they basically track the mu rhythm in the um, subject's brain, motor cortex, and, ident and then try to deliver TMS pulses at specific phases of the rhythm. Um, and then they kind of like compare these different phases to each other and also to a random um, condition of low power um, when no specific, specific phase was identified. So what they found is that like MEPs, like motor evoked potentials, are stronger in the face of the trough and when the, when the sensory motor mu activity rises out of the trough back towards the peak again. So in these two scenarios, in the trough and in the rising phase from the trough towards the peak, um, MEPs were significantly higher 
is indicating higher excitability than um, in the phases of the peak and in the phase of from the peak falling towards the trough, as well as it in, a, in a random low condition, basically. So this indicates that um, the sensory motor neurism uh, expresses different parts or the phases of the sensory motor neurism express different parts of excitation and inhibition and, and, and phase dependency. But we cannot only measure the phase, we can also basically change the phase of an ongoing oscillation. We can manipulate these rhythms. And there are two ways to do this, for instance, once using a phase reset or entrainment. So phase reset in A here refers basically to the phase modulation of an oscillation where B is a single event that is like external to that oscillation um, forces the oscillator into a new specific phase at the time of the disturbance occurrence. Um, and then this oscillation slowly reverts back to its like eigendynamic as illustrated here. And this external event can be, for instance, a visual or auditory stimulus or it can also be induced by brain stimulation, such as TMS. On the other side, entrainment um, is basically an entrainment by rhythmic events that are, again, external to the oscillation system. So external rhythmic events um, basically result in a modulation of the wavelengths and amplitude of the oscillation system. So that this is basically a series of phase resets and it's kind of like a co then the rhythm is constantly being entrained to the entrainer um, and again this external events here can be like repetitive sensory stimulation um, where be for the phase reset it was just a single one where here it would be required to have several repetitive sensory stimulations or again brain stimulation but in this case it would be for instance, repetitive TMS or would be alternating current stimulation so these are basically two ways in which the phase of an ongoing brain isolation can be reset or entrained in this way, basically manipulated. More recently, neural oscillatory activity has not only described by sustained oscillations, but also by transient burst events. So here's an example from a paper from 2017, where we can see a sustained oscillation, a sustained high power around 30 Hz. If we look at the single trials, however, we can see that it's not on a single trial level sustained across the entire time window, but more on the, on the single trial level, we see individual transient bursts and they only appear sustained as well sustained oscillations if we average across all the trials. It's still unclear what the underlying mechanism of these burst events are, is the theory that perhaps it is an underlying oscillatory generator, but only sometimes this underlying oscillatory generator passes a specific threshold, which looks like burst events, or whether the underlying generator is literally um, not an oscillator, but is kind of like sporadic and non-oscillatory. We recently um, started to do, uh, characterize bursts in all three signal domains, where beforehand it was always very clear that burst events are characterized by an event amplitude, a duration, or an interval time, like the time between bursts. Bursts can also be described based on their spectral properties, for instance, the frequency spread, or where in the spectrum this uh, bursts are, this is kind of like the higher or lower frequency range, higher or lower beta, for instance. And finally, we can also try, or at least to attempt to try, to characterize bursts in the spatial domain and identify of like how wide a burst is in space um, and where a burst is located in space. The most prominent example we know from the burst literature is kind of like the relationship between beta burst duration in the sensory motor system and Parkinson's. So in this graph here, we see that we see that shorter bursts are negatively correlated with the clinical impairment of Parkinson's disease, and longer bursts tend to be positively related with clinical impairment. So patients who have more longer bursts have more severe Parkinson's symptoms. So one a classic um, approach to alleviate these symptoms is using deep brain stimulation or short DBS. 
So without DBS, like in the first row here, both short and long beta bursts occur, as we can see in this graph. And in the second row, we see this adaptive deep brain stimulation. And this adaptive deep brain stimulation basically cuts or trims down longer bursts. This basically leaves more space for shorter bursts to occur. As a comparison to this, conventional beta, uh, DBS is basically suppressing the entire amplitude. So it suppresses the amplitude of short bursts on longer bursts. Um, so overall beta is, is kind of like suppressed. Um, and there was a relationship found that this act, um, adaptive DBS is very obviously very battery saving and it's uh, very efficient, but it also um, alleviates Parkinson's symptom, symptoms most. So far, we've always looked at kind of like one source of one oscillator. Um, but what if we have more than one oscillator? So that sometimes this is just described as the connectivity. And this illustration here provides quite well of kind of like how different oscillators or even one oscillator on two different locations are related. So we basically see activity from the left motor cortex in pink and from the right motor cortex in, in green. And we can see that at the beginning they are not um, synchronized, these two systems, and then over time, in a little bit, we see that they are more and more synchronized, so now they're kind of like starting to have their troughs at the same time and their peaks at the same time. But at the beginning it was really like one was behind the other. And there are a lot of different ways to measure functional connectivity, um, and I really don't want to go into the detail of this, so this is basically just a methods overview of different ways to measure functional connectivity. And then on the right side, on the left side, is basically different types of connectivity. For instance, we have cortical cortical connectivity, cortical subcortical connectivity, subcortical subcortical connectivity, cortical spinal connectivity, cortical muscular connectivity. So a lot of different systems can be related to each other with a lot of different ways. And it's just like one example um, from Petra Fischer, where we, she basically shows the phase coupling between cortical um, motor cortex, then basal ganglia and thalamic sites and during movement inhibition, um, which could be nicely shows in this example really kind of like the relationship between cortex, STN, um, global pallidum and thalamus. Another example here is looking at cortical muscular coherence. So we're looking at brain activity measured with MEG and um, activity from um, muscles using surface um, EMG and try to relate how which brain activity relates strongest to the muscle activity frequency. So this is called uh, cortical muscular coherence or cortical muscular connectivity. And finally, after we've talked now all the time about the periodic or oscillatory activity of the electrophysiological signal, I at least want to highlight the fact that there is also an aperiodic or 1 over f activity in electrophysiological activity. So this is usually characterized by basically the slope of the power spectrum. So we know that kind of like lower frequency are expressed by higher power and higher frequency is expressed by lower power. And this kind of like this slope we have from low to high power is basically the aperiodic exponent or the aperiodic 1 over f activity. And this 1 over f component has recently gained a lot of interest and has been related to several properties, for instance, age, tasks, different drugs, diseases. And it also has been suggested that the 1 over f component reflects excited and inhibitory balance. Um, so it's definitely something um, to also consider to not only focus on the periodic activity, but also on the aperiodic activity of the spectrum. So with this, I want to finish um, this talk and I hope we've learned a lot about different recording types and what's the neurophysiological basis of EEG and MEG signal and also a lot of the different um, properties or signatures of EEG and MEG signal, such as event-related potentials, oscillations, um, burst events, aperiodic activity and so on. So I hope you have kind of like the background knowledge and in the following couple of days um, talks you will get all the tools to look at all these different components. Um, so thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please drop me an email.